Hello, everyone. Uh, this is Michael Desset, chair of the New Report Community Preservation Committee, and I'd like to call uh, our committee's meeting to order. First thing I'll do is, is take uh, attendance and ask uh, those in attendance to uh, signify your presence after I call your name. Chuck Griffin. Present. Paul Healy. Present. Jane Healy. Here. Don Little. I am here. Joe Morgan. Present. Mark Rosen. Here. Don Walters. Here. And Tom O'Brien is absent. <clears> okay, <throat> hey, uh, welcome uh, committee members and uh, applicants and members of the public who have joined us. Uh, tonight, uh, we have uh, a full agenda and uh, the <clears throat> first item uh, that uh, we will uh, address are two, um, uh, are, I'm sorry, our one um, emergency motion uh, for uh, uh, presenting an application on an emergency basis. Uh, before I do that, um, <clears throat> uh, later in the agenda where we have presentations uh, from applicants, um, our intent is uh, to have you uh, be assured that uh, the committee members are, have uh, read your applications <clears throat> and uh, are familiar uh, with them and uh, that uh, your uh, presentation um, will help us most. Number one, if you could <clears throat> highlight what you consider to be the mo most salient points uh, that uh, we should focus on. Number two, to add any information that is not in your application that you believe is, is important. <clears throat> and third, uh, leave uh, uh, enough time for all of our questions uh, to, be, uh, to be addressed that uh, uh, we may have uh, after your presentation. And uh, we're hoping that uh, each applicant uh, can uh, uh, limit uh, the presentation uh, and the que questions uh, from the committee um, and, and answers uh, to 15 to 20 minutes. Um, <clears throat> so the uh, next item, or the first item is uh, number two on your uh, printed uh, um, agenda. And it's uh, the uh, Knock Tennis Court Projects uh, Project uh, Emergency Application uh, that is uh, <coughs> Uh, to be, uh, I believe, uh, addressed tonight by Steve Borgham. Is that correct? That's right, yes. Okay, Steve, thank you. Um, Steve, uh, you have the floor, uh, and uh, I'd like you in telling us about uh, the reason for the emergency nature of this application. Uh, also, <clears throat> the uh, uh, need you may have or not have for uh, a... Uh, quick decision to be made by the committee in order to uh, be able to, for instance, go out to bid or something like that. Right. So, so Steve, uh, you have the floor on the tennis court emergency application. We will, we will Steve, before you start, uh, <clears throat> be needing to, to take it in two steps. After we hear you, we'll need to vote on whether to accept it on an emergency basis. And then depending upon uh, your timing needs, uh, whether we will be able to um, uh, vote to uh, uh, approve it or recommend it or not. So Steve, go ahead. Thank you, Mike, appreciate that. And uh, thank you all for having us here tonight and considering this um, emergency grant for the Knock Tennis Court project. Um, I'll jump right into it. I know you've got a full agenda. So um, as you probably recall last year, um, you approved $175,000 for this project that was based on um, approximately $25,000 uh, for the design fees and $150,000 for construction, which was uh, based on a budget quote that we had received from Vermont Tennis Court Surfacing um, back in the uh, January of 2021. Um, so that's where the 
uh, original request for $175,000 came from. Um, unfortunately, obviously, since then, um, like everything else, construction costs have risen. Um, and over the winter, as we worked on um, the bid documents with Huntress Associates, um, there were a lot more details that went into the bid documents um, than were on the original quote from Vermont Tennis Court. Um, there were things like uh, trees that need to be removed uh, along the fence line um, in the existing. Um, there's some additional drainage work because uh, the expanded size of the tennis courts, uh, the storm drain that lands uh, inside the fence area. So that had to be worked out. Um, a little bit of additional fencing work. Um, the backboard that the community wanted to put into uh, the tennis courts on one side uh, was not included in that original uh, budget quote that was received. Um, so all those things together um, added to the project. Um, like I said, we worked on the bid documents over the winter with Huntress Associates. Uh, we made them available to contractors uh, in February of this year. Um, they were sent out directly to more to about two dozen contractors that were identified as, as potential bidders for this project. Uh, we also posted in the central register and in combis, uh, which are procurement tools uh, run by the Commonwealth that we're required to use. Um, and we advertised in a local newspaper. Um, so on um, March 10th, we received three bids back from, um, I don't know if you can read the, the document there, it's kind of small on my screen, um, but from Green Acres. Can you, can you uh, change the, yeah, you know, Zoom, yeah, I think you did it already. Okay, thanks. Okay, so we received- Sorry for the interruption. We received the three bids um, and um, Vermont Recreation came in as the low bidder at about $186,000 uh, on the base bid and $8,900 for um, alternate number one, um, which would allow us to construct the um, sidewalk that's just outside the tennis court um, out of concrete rather than asphalt. And we wanted to do that for basically two reasons. One, because the, the city's kind of tending towards concrete sidewalks rather than asphalt wherever possible. And two, to kind of help delineate that uh, from a vis visual perspective um, for the kids walking into the school from Johnson Street. Um, you know, the, the driveway and that sidewalk are right at the same elevation. Uh, we were unable to put a curb there because of drainage issues to raise that sidewalk up above the driveway. So we thought that the concrete uh, would just give a little bit more of a visual uh, separation there between the driveway and the sidewalk and, and help with a little bit of safety along with the bollards that are along that, that driveway. Um, so with that, um, our new budget then becomes a bit higher than what we had expected. Um, you can go to the next page on that if you would. Thank you. Um, so with uh, the design fees at about 25,000, uh, the legal ad costs and the, the bids from Vermont Recreation, our total project cost now comes to uh, 220,000. Uh, $343, which leaves us with a budget shortfall of about $45,000. So we are here to request uh, a supplemental grant of $50,000, uh, which would provide us with a small contingency um, in case anything else comes up in the, in the, uh, during the construction process. Um, we are a bit on a time sensitive um, nature here. Um, in order to uh, get this project done over the summer when the school is vacated, um, we want to do that because it's, it's right on that busy corner of Johnson Street and the entrance into the Knock Middle School. 
So we want to be able to get it done um, over the summer uh, when, when there's not so much activity there. Uh, and we don't want to um, lose this bidder by dragging this out too long. Uh, because as you probably see on uh, that list of bidders, the next, the next bidder on the list is about another $50,000 higher than the low bidder was. Um, so we really want to um, get this under contract as quickly as, as we can um, so we can move this forward this summer. Um, so that's basically what I have, the, the third page. Um, in my presentation is just the um, recommendation letter from Huntress Associates to award the project to uh, Vermont Recreation. Um, they did reference checks on them um, and they've actually worked, Huntress has actually worked with Vermont Recreation before. Um, so they, um, they're very confident that they can handle the job and recommend that we award the contract to them. So I will take whatever questions you may have. Uh, thank you, Steve. Uh, any questions now from uh, committee members? If you have them, please raise your hand. I have a question. Okay, Mark Rosen. Hi, um, Steve. I'm sorry, but who do you represent? Hi, Mark. I'm the director of facilities for the schools. Okay, all right. And have you managed construction projects like this before? Yes, I have. All right, good, that's great. Um, I just wanna point out that $50,000 is no small amount. It's approximately 5% of our total, total budget that we give out every year. Um, that's number one. And you're actually asking for a 29% increase uh, for your request. Um, I um, had some questions in the first place about the project being a true recreation um, project for us to consider because it, you know, in the criteria, um, it's supposed to support multiple recreation uses and serve a significant number of residents. And I don't see any uh, evidence to either one of those uh, re requirements. Um, from what I understand, it's gonna be primarily used. Uh, the intention of the project was for the school, uh, the school's tennis team, which as I understood it during the time period that you were requesting for the money, it was only a girls team. Uh, that was a concern of mine also. Um, and it's serving a significant number of residents to me with tennis being uh, overrun by pickleball these days. Um, it doesn't seem to fit. So those two factors alone are a, a, a reason why I cannot support your request for this additional funds. All right, let me, let me just um, mention, um, you know, I hear what you're saying. Um, this, this project was actually initiated by a group of residents um, who, who uh, banded together to, um, to, to get this project moving, to um, build support uh, because there is uh, a need for tennis courts in this town, uh, this city. Um, you know, in addition to the public and the, the high school team, eventually, um, the, the courts would be used by uh, the PE classes at the middle school and the Molin school to, to introduce them to the sport of tennis as well. Steve, uh, in the original presentation for the uh, last, you know, in the, for the project itself, uh, there was some talk about um, <clears throat> it, it, by adding these these uh, um, courts uh, in their in the full scope, not only the the 
ones that uh, are for for this application, but the ones that are planned adjacent to it, uh, you could then um, uh, host uh, tournaments and ha have enough uh, courts to uh, to do that. Um, Am I, am I remembering that correctly? That, that's correct, Mike, yes. Okay, okay, good. Uh, Don Walters, is your hand up? Yes, it is. It is. Okay. Thank you. A, a couple of couple of questions. Uh, I think maybe, Mike, the first one is for you. Would you mind explaining what this emergency application is for? Is for us to put it with the rest to accept it, and then in turn, will eventually go to the city council and go through their entire process, which perhaps may mean this will get approved, I don't know, July, August, September. Am I correct in understanding the timing of this? Well, if it, it does not, if we accept it uh, for consideration um, and potential recommendation as an emergency uh, application, it is not necessary that it be taken with the, the current uh, docket and the timing that that goes through. It, it can be uh, uh, voted on um, once we accept, uh, accept it for consideration out of sequence. Uh, and then uh, if, it's, uh, rec it's, if it's voted to recommend to the city council, it gets shipped off to city council uh, as a standalone on its own. Uh, and uh, the applicant then uh, uh, moves with it uh, to city council, hoping to get it up, approved uh, uh, for appropriation uh, to add to the budget, <clears throat> and uh, as as the applicant pointed out, uh, so that they don't miss the construction season and, and get it going. So that's that's the, Thank you. that's the the timing that goes with the emergency status. So, and do we know, Mike, by any chance, or perhaps Caitlin, the planning office, has reached out to some of the city council? And not that that necessarily means that we should vote on this, but uh, do we have a, a, a feel or the pulse of the city council to um, really accept this and, and make this quickly, make a decision quickly? Yeah, Don, this is Andy. Um, and Caitlin, feel free to weigh in as well. Um, generally speaking, we've reached out to the council, uh, to the Budget and Finance Chair Committee in, uh, in particular, and uh, asked whether they'd be willing to sponsor this given the time frame. So obviously, uh, as you've noted, there's an additional process for the council, but um, we're working to make sure that there's a sponsor ready for expedited approval by the council should the CPC make the recommendation. Oh, thank you. Um, another point or two, and, and I think Mark, you may have asked this question. Uh, I, um, I represent the, the planning board uh, on the CPC and, and uh, it was interesting when, the, when this hit the planning board, we actually raised the same point you did is, is why can't we have pickleball, um, especially with aging population? And I, in planning board meeting, as I'll do now, I, I put myself in that majority. <laughs> uh, it's interesting in the planning office had a, a, had a, a good point is they said, actually, uh, of course, the people that want to play pickleball want to play, but the residents don't like it. It actually is more noisy than tennis. And so there is a concern that, uh, I don't know where we'll ever find a pickleball court, uh, unless it's the private one by the tennis racket club. But anyway, I just wanted to provide a, a bit of that flavor there. And secondly, uh, uh, Steve, or perhaps uh, um, to, to Andy and Caitlin, the planning board, uh, this is my opinion, not the plan, opinion of the planning board, is always good to put on third parties all these requirements, et cetera, to do. Um, and Steve, would you have any, any estimate of were there any things that the planning board put on that if you went back to the planning board and asked for a, a, a minor uh, amendment to this plan that would save save the city money and, and in turn the CPC funds? Uh, you, you mean um, adjustments to the scope of the project, Don? Yeah, you know, you know, let's, uh, let's just basically, you know, we like to make things pretty, put more trees, do this. Um, you know, I did hear the point about the concrete sidewalk, although I think that was something that the planning board did request. Um, you did, and, and I will mention, and perhaps it's comparing apples with oranges, Steve, and, and Andy and Caitlin, you know, much better than I do, but I know we put uh, 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 asphaltic pavement down by uh, the, the uh, uh, Parker Street, where, where we connected with, with, with the new development there, 
uh, by, 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 the, by the railroad. So it seems to me, I'm not convinced that we're totally consistent, that every new sidewalk will always be concrete. So I would just say, uh, I don't have a strong feeling one or the other, but again, if that perhaps uh, allows one or two more votes by the CPC, you might want to consider that. I think that's all I have right now, Mike. Thank you. Okay, thank you. A any other questions from the committee? Uh, Paul, uh, Mike. Yes. Uh, yeah, I'm just wondering if if we uh, accept this as a uh, an emergency and and were to uh, vote to um, send it recommended over to city council. Uh, I would kind of like to do it without the cost of the um, of the cement walkway, since it wasn't in the plan last time. Um, I don't see why we would really want to fund that. If the city really, really, really wants cement, maybe they can find it in another piece of the budget, but not ours. Okay. Uh, Jane Healy, question? Uh, it's my understanding that um, the CPA does not allow us to fund sidewalks. Is anyone else familiar? Uh, this is Andy. Uh, this is Andy. Sorry. Uh, generally speaking, um, Caitlin, feel free to weigh in if there's uh, more you've discussed with the um, preservation um, coalition. But generally speaking, it, this uh, rule is that you're not doing anything to replace uh, work that the city would be doing under the Department of Public Services within the right of way um, relative to sidewalks or um, um, you know infrastructure on a regular on a normal basis. I think that maybe the question here is whether or not it's integrated with the project such that it's required for um, pedestrian or um, youth access. You know. And Steve, is that your um, feeling that it's integrated into the project enough that it would not fall under their, um, what Andy just explained, excluding it from our funding? It is because, well, it, it has to be, uh, the existing sidewalk has to be ripped up um, in order to um, construct the new tennis courts. It's just uh, the asphalt there is, it's all interconnected with, with the tennis courts there. Uh, but having said that, I honestly, I don't, you know, it wouldn't be a real deal, deal breaker if we didn't do that in concrete. Um, you know, if, if people are, are more comfortable um, leaving that portion of it out, we can still proceed uh, getting the project done this summer. Yeah. I have another question, Mike. Mark, go ahead. Yeah, sorry. Um, to Paul's point, there were two other items that weren't in the original uh, request also, and that was trees to be removed and drainage work, I believe. Um, and a question for Mike, um, which budget does the $50,000 come out of? The, the, the new budget, correct? It comes out of whatever current funds we have available now, yes. Right, so that would take 50,000 away from all the other requests that we have. Mm -hmm. That's correct. There is, there is no, res uh, there is no uh, recreation reserve. Okay, and does anybody on the panel or Steve or Andy know of any other sources for um, this project to raise money instead of CPC? Um, well, this Hi, is Andy and feel free. Oops. Caitlin, go right oh, ahead. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Um, this is Caitlin. Um, I just wanted to um, remind the CPC that I touched base with uh, Ethan Manning, the finance director, um, and the source of these funds for this emergency application would be coming out of the community preservation fund balance on designated funds right here on my cursor is. Right. That, yeah. And that's, that's part of the uh, budget that we're working with on uh, the whole docket. Correct. This cycle. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, this is Andy. I yeah. guess to the question about other sources, I would say that the council um, can always be, um, you know, a counselor can be requested to um, move forward, you know, a motion to try to work with um, other sources of funds. Um, the mayor's office obviously can initiate um, something like that with the council as well, but to, to mobilize, say, free cash or some other source. Um, but um, obviously here the, the request is well enough to use CPA funds. Is there any way that we can approve this contingent on 
exhausting all other possible sources, Michael? Uh, you mean for their their budget, uh, their total budget, or are we talking about the sidewalks now? The fifty thousand, the total, uh, budget. the whole, the whole fifty. Yeah, um, Mike, might I weigh in on that? Or whatever. Yes. Or I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, sorry, this is the just okay. to, uh, for okay. clarify, for just to make a point. Um, it, it would be important to clarify what would be enough to um, to you know what what is the threshold in which. Uh, one is verified that all those sources have been ex exhausted. Uh, right. You know, is that specifically asking all city councilors to, you know, to sponsor something to bring forward funds um, or, or otherwise, but a, it, just a recommendation that wherever um, this goes, it'd be something that's clear enough that can be implemented or, uh, or determine whether or not something's in compliance. Yeah, that, that would be my, con my concern is to get a bright line. You know, how, how do you articulate a bright line test as to, you know, how many, how many doors you have to knock on? things like that in, in order to satisfy that condition um, or, in, you know, in, uh, other, otherwise you'd also have uh, a, another layer of uh, people wondering how many doors, doors to knock on, uh, depending on how, how many um, uh, councilors, city councilors are, are looking at this and saying, okay, uh, have we satisfied the CP, CPC's uh, con, uh, condition of exhaustion? Um, so I, you know, as a practical matter, what's happened in the past with, with, uh, with projects uh, uh, that, that uh, the, the committee believes that, uh, you know, uh, other sources of, of funding should share in it, uh, they just uh, 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 recommend a lesser amount than is requested. And, uh, um, you know, the applicant then is left to his uh, own devices to, uh, uh, make the budget, uh, and in this case, since it's a city project, uh, they're going to have to have it fully funded before they can award the contract. So. Okay, that that makes sense. Thank you, Michael. Okay, and let me let me just point out also that when we first received the bids back in March uh, on March 10th, um, and we saw where the budget was with regard to that, uh, first thing I did was reached out to Ethan Manning. Um, to ask his advice on um, how we could fill that gap. And uh, it was his feeling at the time um, that the city council and the mayor would prefer that we went to the CPC for the funds. Okay, thank you. Uh, Don Little, question? Yeah, a couple things I'd like to speak in favor. Um, actually, a couple different topics. The uh, criteria of uh, this being available to multiple users is my understanding that um, the restriction to the public is only during school hours mm -hmm. and when the, the school teams reserve it. And I don't really think they use it um, all day and night. And I certainly don't think they're in school during the summer and possibly not even using it um, all spring or fall. So I think there's plenty of use by the public. As far as the sidewalks, um, I believe the application for Fuller Field had sidewalks in it, so I don't know if that's a precedent setting thing. And as far as the emergency part of it, um, also the, uh, the concrete sidewalk, I'd be in favor of. I mean, I heard Mr. Bergholm state that it's more of a safety issue to really delineate it um, from the driveway. That is a very busy driveway at school time, and uh, there isn't much space between the driveway and the sidewalk. So as far as the emergency, um, you know, I just can't imagine we would say, uh, let's recommend this conditionally. I mean, if, if we were to recommend this tonight, I would presume there's a an order being written up for city council approval as early as tomorrow. And this would need to get approved pretty soon for the bid to get um, approved. Steve, Steve, uh, for my, uh, just to clarify that sidewalk we talking about, is that, uh, is that uh, the, uh, along Johnson street or along the, uh, the uh, driveway parking lot? Uh, it's along the it's along the driveway, um, and it's okay. just it's just the section uh, that's immediately adjacent to the tennis court. It doesn't 
include the rest of it that goes all the way up to the school. Right. Okay. Thank you. Um, I would I would echo uh, Don's comment that uh, the uh, uh, concrete uh, would would certainly uh, delineate it more clearly than additional asphalt on uh, as you know just blended into the driveway and be, be a greater safety feature. I also am am uh, confident that uh, that is part part of the, uh, the the project a necessary part of the project and it's not uh, something that uh, would be uh, not eligible um, for CPA funding. Uh, Don Waters, other question? Yes. Uh, Steve, you mentioned that you received the bids, I believe, the beginning of March. How, what, how long were the bids, uh, the, the bid prices effective? And the reason I asked, I'm not trying to set you up, Steve, is, you know, typically it's 30 or 60 days. And my concern is that uh, with them seeing, as you mentioned, the other bidder was, I don't know, 50,000 or plus more that um, uh, you know, we can't control going forward. But, uh, you know, I, I guess uh, if, if the bidder was not necessarily of highest integrity, and I'm not saying they, they aren't, but uh, one could expect them to come up with some other excuse to have the bid even higher since they know the next bidder was even X number of thousands of dollars more. So uh, just a, a, a long pre prelude to what, what is the, uh, how long are these, these bid prices effective for? The, uh, the specifications call for us to uh, award the contract within 30 days of the uh, bid opening. Um, excluding weekends and holidays. So uh, basically, I think when I figured it out, we have until um, April 20th. Okay. And do you think, or does Andy think, or anyone else think that's that's practical, realistic for the city council and maybe bringing in subcommittee um, readings, all those things? Uh, this is Andy. I guess uh, I guess I would say it's up to the councilors uh, how they want to handle the, the matter after the CPC recommendation, if that's brought forward. But generally speaking, it's definitely doable. The council uh, has procedures in place to deal with emergency uh, orders or actions, and um, and if uh, you know there's a willingness or um, you know a shared um, interest in getting that expedited to say on schedule, and then I can certainly appreciate as a fellow project manager uh, what Steve has to go through and um, trying to align the different timings of available funds and procurement procedures and, and so forth. Um, I, I think that's very important to keep those things uh, and use the, the time frames and the processes that align. Um, and I definitely believe it's feasible for the council to uh, do their portion of the action necessary to, to bring this forward, you know, should the CPC and the council agree that it's, uh, that it's worthy of funding. Thanks, Andy. I'm, I'm sure the city council would have a fire lit under, under them if there was a letter from that lowest bidder saying, if you don't award it be by such as I'm raising my price, but I won't be so cynical. Thank you. <laughs> any other questions from the committee? Okay, uh, any member of the public uh, that wishes to uh, ask a question, please raise your hand at this time. I see one from Jim McCauley. Jim? Uh, thank you, uh, Chair. Um, uh, just as uh, for those who don't know me, I am a member of the city council and um, uh, I was part of budget and finance when we approved this uh, 175 uh, out of committee over six months ago. So kind of my first question is, um, you know, why did it take so long for us to actually get a bid out uh, and respond to our, our bidding request, right? We had done this in the fall. Uh, we started the process of putting uh, the bid specs and the plans together right after the city council approved in the fall. Um, working with the designer and, um, you know, basically the ideal time for going out to bid for projects to do in the summer is, is during the winter. Um, yeah. like yeah. I said, we had, the, we had the bids out in February. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll tell you, we were, we were under the impression that the, um, bid documents were ready to go, uh, when we voted on it. So, um, you know, that's a, uh, that's a shame on us, I guess. Right. Um, it, just a couple of comments. Um, uh, concrete is not a uh, necessarily a preferred method anymore. Um, uh, it was with the previous administration. It's not necessarily uh, what we're looking at right now. I think from a safety issue and a costing issue, I think you could 
uh, put so, put uh, replacing kind with asphalt. And if you wanted to highlight things with paint, uh, with for safety, you can uh, do it with paint. Um, Mass DOT is doing that on uh, the Route One traffic circle to save uh, millions of dollars in uh, in expenses, and they're uh, effectively utilizing paint. I think, as a suggestion, you might want to be able to do that. Uh, I don't see an appetite for the uh, concrete, um, uh, but I never see an appetite uh, for uh, the sidewalk along the way. Um, CPC and sidewalks uh, don't necessarily blend together. Um, you know, ever since the uh, landmark Norwell case, and and um, um, uh, I'm an originalist on that, um, which I'll say. Um, the group of residents that um, you know kind of started this was was actually friends of Newburyport Tennis, which were supporters of the high school teams along the way. So it's uh, it doesn't necessarily have broadband, uh, broad uh, community support, although. You know, this is a school facility, and I've always thought that the school has a um, a building fund and, and, and uh, maintenance dollars within their um, you know thirty six million dollar budget that they uh, probably um, could uh, look through and and try to reallocate some of these funds uh, going forward. Uh, I do know that um, uh, there is a sponsor for this emergency. Uh, and there is an order written, and it'll be in the 28th packet. Um, that's Monday. Uh, it'll go to committee, and um, uh, the next council meeting will be the 11th. If it, if it makes it out of committee, uh, you should be all set. If it doesn't make it out of committee because of any concerns, then you won't make the 20th, uh, as we won't have an additional meeting uh, to be able to award that. Um, you know, I, I'm concerned uh, about um, the different um, line items that are uh, that show up here that you know un were unbeknownst to everyone involved in the original hundred and seventy five thousand dollar request. Uh, I'm not sure if uh, you know we've explored um, in sourcing some of this work. Uh, you know, uh, sourcing over to the parks department, for example, cutting down a tree or DPS cutting down the tree, and trying to scale back some of the actual ask uh, of the funds. Um, I say these things um, uh, kind of as coaching uh, to Steve so that, you know, these are the things that are gonna come out and come out of committee um, that will come out of the budget and finance committee that will, you know, scale back regardless of what um, uh, the CPC committee does and the recommendation they make. Uh, I'm just suggesting to you that these are the types of questions you're going to face uh, on the committee from budget and finance to be able to uh, scale this back. Um, thank you. I yield. Thank you, Councilor. Councilor. Steve, you just cut out. I'm sorry, I just said thank you, Councilor. Okay, good. Uh, any other questions from uh, the public? Okay, that I'd like to. Uh, uh, oh, first open this up uh, for uh, motion and discussion uh, from the committee uh, on uh, accepting this application on an emergency basis. Uh, do I have a motion? This is Don Walters, I'll make that motion. Okay, uh, motion's been made to accept this application um, uh, on an emergency basis. Uh, is there any discussion on that limited issue, whether we accept it now? Uh, do you need a second? I'm sorry, Mike, do you need a second? Yes, I do. This is Jane, I'll second. Okay. Uh, is there any discussion? Okay. Then uh, we'll have a roll call vote uh, on accepting this application on an emergency basis. Uh, Chuck Griffin? Yes. Paul Healy. Yes. Jane Healy. Yes. Don Little. Yes. Joe Morgan. Yes. Mark Rosen. No. Don Walters. Yes. Uh, chair votes yes. And the uh, motion is passed to accept this uh, on an emergency basis. 
now we move uh, to, uh, uh, I'll uh, <clears throat> entertain uh, a motion uh, from the committee uh, on the uh, merits of, uh, of the application. Question, please. Uh, who's that, Mark? Uh, yes. It's Mark, I'm sorry. Um, I, I'm not clear, are you, are you saying, what are you asking for now? Uh, asking for a motion so that we can have some discussion uh, and a motion from a committee member uh, as, you know, to, to approve, to approve in a certain amount. Yeah, Mike? So, yes, Paul Healy? Uh, yeah, I would make a motion to uh, approve uh, allocating, a, requ uh, requesting the city council allocate uh, $40,000 from our reserve funds uh, for this increase in the uh, project costs. Okay, is there a second? This is Jane, I second. Okay, so it's been moved and seconded to uh, approve the application in the amount of $40,000. Uh, any discussion? Yes. Uh, Chuck Griffin? Uh, I'm the representative of Parks, as you know. Yes. And when the issue came before us, uh, the friends of New Report Tennis were behind it, one thing and another, needing courts. And of course, Parks would like to see more of that, including the solution of pickleball, which is uh, on us every month. It received a very low interest among the Parks uh, commissioners. And uh, uh, I've not had a chance to, uh, maybe it's my own fault, to talk to my fellow commissioners to get their view on it. But with the uh, with what we have in front of us, I'm afraid that I would have to vote no on this uh, in this application. Thanks, Chuck. Uh, Don Walters. Yes, uh, I'd like to know if we could also um, provide a, a, a condition, and I think we can make it specific, uh, subject to uh, Caitlin and Andy's, and, and of course the, the rest of the uh, committee's approval. I, I, my sense is that there is a there there is some consensus. Uh, I know, and I realize we haven't voted to to have this asphaltic, and and you there's multiple ways to delineate it. Painting was was one suggestion, et cetera. I thought uh, that the councilor McCauley made an excellent suggestion that sometimes that uh, the the our, our in house services DPW DPU whatever can cut down trees whatever and could be more economical. Uh, so I would like to see if we could, we would approve this and, and of the forty thousand dollars I suggested, um, sub, sub, subject to that the DPW, for whatever reason, says they cannot take down those trees. Uh, I think the drainage is probably a bit more complicated, uh, and, and I noted that Chairman McCauley didn't necessarily suggest that, although. Not, none of us have done an exhaustive study on what would be required and, and what is the skill level, et cetera, of the DPW. But, but I think cutting down trees and moving trees is something they've done. They actually just did it today in front of my street. So uh, if that's possible, Mike, I, I'd like to throw that condition in there. So it's up to $40,000, but it would be less if DPW says that they, they can do that. If they save 1,000 or 5,000, it, it is what it is. So I don't know if that, if that makes sense, Mike. Thank you. My my comment on that would be uh, we've you know the re the request is is uh, uh, fifty. Um, Steve, the request is fifty forty five plus five. The the request is fifty, um, yep. but that includes the sidewalk being concrete. So if if great. Uh, yeah. The committee is more comfortable with forty thousand uh, than the sidewalk remains asphalt as it is now. Right. Okay. <laughs> um, gotcha. And uh, do you have do you have uh, how much was the uh, the tree tree elements uh, in the quote? Is that was that uh, a the, line item? No, it, but that was not delineated. Okay. We'd have okay. to go back and research that. All right. Um, so. Uh, if, if we were to condition it, um, Don, 
uh, to uh, is your condition that uh, none of the money be used for the trees? Oh, what? I'm sorry, <laughs> Mike. It would be used for the trees if if the DPW said they could not do it for whatever reason right. that they were. That, that, oh, that would be I the see, condition. I see. Okay. Um, yeah, this is Andy. If I could know, just. Mike, maybe uh, in the in the uh, letter to the city council, we could say that you know we're authorizing up to forty thousand, uh, but uh, we would suggest that the applicant attempt to uh, see if they can uh, reduce the cost of the tree removal by using uh, city uh, resources. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't have to say that that's the demand on our side recommendation that people try to work together to save the save some money okay uh chuck do you have something else no chuck I, Griffin? Didn't, I didn't raise my hand have i uh it's still well, up I there see, but i'll you can, see, I'm, okay. I'm sorry i didn't lower it <laughs> thank you jane jane healy uh, I'm trying to I, i'm remembering back to last year's application and uh just in terms of public benefit and public support. I remember there were several letters of support from residents along Johnson Street. Um, so I don't wanna forget that. Um, I'm in support of the 40,000 um, to the exclusion of the sidewalk. And so that's why I was in support or that's why I'm in support of the 40 versus the 50. Um, and in terms of use, uh, I have a, a son who just started the tennis team. So um, I'll put that out there, but it is amazing how the boys tennis team um, is coming along. I guess four years, there were just a few students last year, there was 17 and now there's over 30. And so I, I, someone had mentioned there was just a girls team, but there's a boys team too. And they all have to go half the time to Triton because there's just not enough courts in the city. Um, so that's a, there's quite a few people out there that are, are looking for more courts than in Newburyport. Mark Rosen. Hi, yeah, thanks. Um, I just wanna reiterate that I heard from, well, first let me say that I heard from two people this evening, one from the public, uh, the, Jim McCauley, and one from a member of the parks, committee that they clearly see that there is not broad support in the community for spending this kind of money for tennis courts. I, I heard that from two people who I think have their fingers on the pulse of where they need to be. I think the letters from a few people on Johnson Street are, are you know, in the category of anecdotal and have no uh, uh, meaning in terms of broad support. And especially we have a responsibility to the criteria under which we operate that any project we approve must support multiple recreation uses and serve a significant number of residents. I've been on this committee, what, three years and I, We've never said no to any request. Never once have we said no to any request. This is the first time I honestly believe that we must stop, you know, our rubber stamping of every request that comes through our committee. We must obey the rules under which we are uh, supposed to operate. Um, and the only way for them to seek other sources of funds, as has been explained tonight, is for us to say no. And understanding that the bids did not go out in a fashion that could have prevented this request in the first place. Um, I don't think it's appropriate as well to have to come up with another 50,000 when that could have been avoided potentially. 
Thank you very uh, much. Mark, briefly, um, I believe the language of the criteria indicates that, that uh, ideally, uh, in terms of uh, hierarchy of uh, approval of, of uh, competing um, uh, projects, that uh, serving uh, multiple um, uh, items is, is uh, you know, the ideal and then you work down down from there. I don't think that there's a requirement that uh, that a recreational uh, category uh, serve um, well, uh, multiple. Is that is that uh, well um, exactly? The first bullet is support multiple recreation uses. Okay, so we go yeah, to the second yeah. bullet: serve a significant number of residents. Okay, right. so so we have a problem with the first two bullets expand the range of recreational opportunities available to city residents of all ages. That's, that's a little warmer. Uh, jointly benefit conservation commission and parks commissions initiatives. Uh, neither one of those have anything to do with this proposal. Maximize the utility of land already owned by the city. I don't think that applies. And promote the creative. Well, use I think of I think it I think it does, Mark. If you consider what's there now. Okay, fine. You know that's, that's yeah. debatable. Sure, I, I I see your point. And promote the okay. creative use of railway and other corridors, etc. So I, I again, I'm just I, I'm just trying to play by the rules. I'm gotcha. I'm just seeing I'm just seeing it black and white here. I'm not. Listen, I I don't play tennis. I used to. I mean, I I would love it for this school to be able to provide the kids in school those tennis courts. I do see that there's a benefit there. And if I did play tennis, instead of going to Perkins where they're always playing pickleball now, I would have another option. And are there any other tennis courts in the city? Anybody know? I think so. I think so too. So, it's clear to me, and, and I just want to encourage us to look at the rules and play by the rules. Thank you. Um, are, there, are there any other um, comments from the committee? Uh, I'd like to, to clarify between Paul's motion and Don's comment, um, whether uh, there's a request to uh, amend the motion uh, to include the uh, recommendation that the uh, 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 up to $40,000, the up to be added, as well as the recommendation that uh, uh, the city be looked to to uh, have uh, in-house uh, personnel do the tree work. Is that... Uh, Don, is that uh, which, uh, a, an amendment you were requesting? Uh, I, it was initially, but I, I do think that the, um, the, the, the suggestion to forward this, you know, if this is approved, to um, request uh, other city services to look into uh, assisting this, I, I would be okay with that as compared to amending the, the motion that I think is on the floor. Well, Mike, I, I, you know, I, actually, I, I think including that as an amendment to uh, the motion would be fine. It's just saying that in, in our uh, recommendation that, that that is one of the things that we, we would suggest that they also consider, that the city council also consider. I, I guess I'm un, I guess I'm un, unclear. Um, is are you uh, is what's the motion, Paul? What's your motion? Uh, the, the motion would be to uh, the city council to that, that would uh, we request they authorize up up to uh, forty thousand dollars for this project, uh, not including uh, the cement uh, sidewalk, uh, and that they. Uh, sh should consider uh, out of that 40,000 that if the city services can uh, provide 
some help with uh, some cost saving with regards to the tree removal that uh, we would then not expend the entire 40,000. Uh, I don't know if you'd be able to actually make that effective because a contract's a contract and yeah. they, they either have to sign a contract as is or request another bid. Oh, oh, I see. Yeah. Right. Okay, then, uh, you know. Uh, so, so. Why, you know, why don't we just we, then proceed with the uh, if, if you think, if you think we're, if, if what you're saying is you're implying that we're allocating too much money that's your feeling that that we're allocating too much money and they should go look for money elsewhere as well is, is what you're implying by that motion anyways so perhaps your motion should be twenty five thousand. <laughs> well as as i understand it what we have from the original motion is a recommendation um, uh, to the city council to uh, appropriate $40,000 to this, an additional $40,000 to this project. That's, right. that's, that's what's in front of us. Okay, that, and, and, and that was my original motion and that was seconded. Then I think Don proposed an amendment. Uh, do we? Don, do we want to just take that amendment off the table? Uh, I I was that was just discussion. Yes, I'm happy to retract yeah. and bringing that that point up, and it would just be covered by a uh, covered by a, a transmittal letter to the yeah. city council, whomever we send it to. Thanks. Yeah, Jane, Jane Healy. Um, yeah, yeah. I guess I have two things pointing out that. The concrete sidewalk was 8,900. So there's a thousand in there that I guess, um, yeah, is the wiggle room maybe for that tree removal if they can't. Um, I don't know. Sorry, forget that. <laughs> I'm just trying to, I think we'll just take that off the table. Um, I do want to get back to Mark's point about following the rules because, as anyone who knows me, I like to follow the rules too. So I looked up the definition of um, recreational use in the CPA Act itself um, and just reading word for word, active or passive recreational use, including but not limited to the use of land uh, for our community gardens, trails and non-commercial youth and adult sports and the use of land as a park, playground or athletic field. Um, and so there's no hierarchy there. Um, so just wanted to to read that out. Okay. Any other discussion from the committee? Okay, then I'd uh, like to call for a vote on the motion. Uh, Chuck Griffin? Regrettably, no. <laughs> Paul Healy? Yes. Jane Healy? Yes. Don Little? Yes. Joe Morgan? I will abstain. I, I'm not sure following this discussion, I would have voted uh, in favor of the original 2021 project. So I think I should just, uh, I should just uh, bow out right now. Okay. Joe Morgan abstains. Mark Rosen? No. Don Walters? Yes. Chair votes yes. Okay. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. Appreciate it. Next item on the agenda are the uh, list uh, of applicants' uh, presentations from uh, this cycle, the regular cycle. First one on the agenda is the uh, kitchen renovation project for the YWCA of Newburyport. Is anyone here to present? Well, uh, wasn't that project taken off the uh, list? No, I don't, not yet, I don't believe. Was oh, it? I thought there was something that uh, went around that it, um, 
that that kind of work would not be covered by CPA. Paul, it will be in a second. <laughs> yes, there there has been some uh, correspondence to that effect, but as far as I know, um, oh, 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 but nothing official. Nothing official. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, John Fien, are you here to present? I am. Okay. You have the floor. Thank you very much. And I, I want to say thank you very much for this opportunity to, to say a few words. <clears throat> um, the YWCA uh, was founded in 1883 and in 1890 acquired the Frothingham Estate, which was built in 1790. Um, we've been using it as affordable housing ever since. And when I talk with colleagues, I always say that we have the longest continually operated affordable housing program in the country that we started in, in 1890. And they say, well, we've got older affordable housing projects than that. And I say, yes, but in the same building. And they always reply, no, nobody's crazy enough to run affordable housing out of a 200 year old building, except us here in Newburyport. Um, and the building has, is currently in very good shape in large part due to uh, the support of the, of the community and the, and the support of the uh, CPC. When I submitted this application earlier this year, I was not aware that there was a regulation that says that if the property was not purchased, unless the, unless the property was purchased with CPA funds, it's not eligible for CPA funding. Of course, we purchased this in 1890, long before CPA funding uh, was in existence. And so we will now have a challenge moving forward with a 200 year old building uh, that we want to maintain in good condition for our tenants. Um, but given that that is the rule, uh, we are withdrawing our application uh, from the CPA. And what I would hope is that when the New Report, New Report Affordable Housing Trust presents their uh, request for funding, uh, that you can see it in your hearts to at least award what they've uh, asked for and possibly increase their award uh, if, if that's at all possible. I, I know you've got a long night, so I won't take any more of your time unless there are questions. Thank you, John. Are there, are there any questions from the count committee? Jane, did you have a question? No. No, that was okay. a leftover hand. Okay. Any, anyone else? Okay. Thank you, John. Uh, next item. We have uh, priority housing needs. Um, an update of the housing production plan from the Newburyport Affordable Housing Trust. And Madeline Nash is here to present. Good evening. Thank you. It's great to uh, be here tonight. And thank you for all of the CPC's uh, support over the years. And uh, nice to hear John Fian say, uh, give us some more money. That's very <laughs> Thoughtful. <laughs> uh, anyways, um, I've been on the Newburyport Affordable Housing Trust since it was formed in 2010. Um, and um, before that, I was on the CPC. So um, I know how hard your job is. But um, since the trust was formed in 2010, I mean, housing issues have only become more pressing. I think. Um, most of you are aware that um, it's very hard for people who grow up in Newburyport to um, hope to afford their first home here. Um, it's hard for people who work in our local businesses, um, whether it's a store or a restaurant or teachers, um, some of the municipal employees, very hard for them to afford rental housing or home ownership housing, uh, seniors who want to downsize, there's often not a suitable place for them to move to. People with mobility limitations, it's hard for them to find a place where they can age in place safely. There's just a whole host of housing needs facing our community. Um, I'm sure, like I say, I'm sure most of you are, are aware of this. Um, Another thing is our rental housing stock has, has shrunk due to condo conversion. So we have a lot of things that we're grappling with. And one of the ways that we try to understand it is with doing a 
housing production plan uh, every five years. And uh, it's time for us to get ready to update ours again. The one that we have now doesn't expire until October of 2023. But what we would like to do is hire a consultant to help us um, to update our housing production plan. That's what we did with our first one. I think that cost about $32,000. We were fortunate with our second housing production plan that the Merrimack Valley Planning Commission was able to do it for the city at no cost. But um, my understanding is, is that the Planning Commission will not be available to do that this time. They don't have the funding. So we want to be ready um, to um, pull together an RFP and um, solicit proposals, review the proposals, all of that takes some time. So we're trying to position ourselves with this request to you tonight um, to give us some funding to, to cover that cost. Um, the second request is for $200,000. Um, to um, add to our resources to be ready to support affordable housing initiatives when they present themselves. Um, we know that the Brown School is being considered for conversion <laughs> to affordable housing for seniors. And um, that's a really exciting opportunity for the city. However, it will be very expensive to convert that historic building that is in significant need of capital improvements to housing. Um, we've seen it done elsewhere in other communities very successfully, um, but it is very expensive. And so um, there's the potential that for these funds, if they were committed to be used to not only help cover the cost, but also to help um, position a developer um, to compete for uh, limited state resources that are available for affordable housing development. So that process applying to the Department of Housing and Community Development is extremely competitive. Um, and the way that developers compete for those funds is if they, they really pretty much have to have a local funding match, especially if a community has CPA funds the state is going to be looking for the host municipality to have a commitment to make. Um, so again, that is not just to make the application com competitive, but also to help cover development costs. Uh, funding from the state is allocated on a per unit basis. Um, so it's just very hard to cover those costs with a, a, a pretty, you know, the building is not that big. So um, it's going to be tough to make the numbers work. We're also certainly hoping that there will be other affordable housing development opportunities. We want to be ready um, if an opportunity presents us, presents itself to us. And so um, that's really the reason for our request. And um, I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Doug Walters. Yes, uh, would it make any sense for the uh, consultant who is going to update the uh, uh, housing plan if if the timing was such that there may be other surrounding communities that needed something where you one could get some economy of scale, or even if the timing worked out well, it just Newburyport is very different than the surrounding communities, and therefore it, it really doesn't make any sense. Well, um, it's a good question. Um, I think that whoever does the report um, will look not just at the needs in Newburyport, but the surrounding communities, because it really should be a local and a regional perspective. Um, and it also gives you a point of comparison. Um, but I don't know um, when other communities with CPA funds uh, might be in the position of updating their plans. It's supposed to be done, my understanding is supposed to be done every five years. So I don't know that you know, everybody's gonna be on the same calendar. But uh, you know, it certainly would be worth looking into, is there some opportunity for collaboration with neighboring communities? This is a good point. 
Thank you. And just just one other quick question. With respect to the um, fund that you're, you're looking for, which in turn would allow a developer to use those funds and, and get matching. And would I be correct when you use the word matching? Is it one to one? So $200,000 would be a total of 400,000 or is it some other ratio? Uh, it's not one for one. The way it works, um, and I must admit that I deal with this in my professional capacity working uh, for a quasi state organization called Community Economic Development Assistance Corporation. Uh, one of the things that we do is we work with DHCD to review funding applications um, for the development of affordable housing. So um, I spent all day long today looking at funding applications. And um, basically, uh, most um, properties cost approximately $500,000 per unit. Um, it's a ton of money. Um, and there is no percent uh, that is expected from a host municipality. It's certainly not one for one, not even in the city of Boston where they have so many resources. But I think what's considered, at, you know, what the state considers is, well, what is a community like Newburyport have to offer. You know, there's not much CDBG funding anymore. Home dollars are very limited, um, but the city does have CPA. So that would probably be the likely source. I think it's also true that with municipally owned properties like school buildings, there's an expectation that the host municipality will um, donate that space. So that's another way that the city can show its commitment to meeting the need for affordable housing. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question, um, but it's um, it's called matching funds, but it's certainly not one to one. Thank you. Any other questions from the committee? Chuck Griffin. Uh, just an observation, Madeline. I'm an architect that's done elderly housing his whole life and affordable housing. I would just encourage you to uh, think twice about Brown School. There's going to be nothing affordable in trying to make that an elderly housing project. If you just simply think about every aspect that makes up a building, Brown School doesn't have any of those things that are usable. It will cost... Uh, significantly more money than new construction to try to use Brown School. It's just an observation. Thank you. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I appreciate that. Um, it, we, you know, school buildings can be inefficient because they have a lot of uh, non-rentable space, corridors and, and whatnot. But um, on the other hand, uh, they are, often well situated within a community. Um, you know, the Brown School is in a great neighborhood. Um, it's, a, it's a resource that we want to see preserved. And this is one way to do that. Um, and also there aren't really a lot of other development opportunities in Newburyport, um, unfortunately. So this is a site that the city has control over. Um, and it's a great location and it's a community asset. It's got historic value. Um, I'm hoping it will be eligible for historic tax credits, um, but you're right. There's nothing uh, easy about this and there's nothing inexpensive about this. Any other questions from committee members? Okay, Councilor McCauley, your hand is up. Uh, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, just one uh, question to the applicant. Um, the um, the uh, the Brown School is an asset, and um, it's very much in play for a number of different um, uh, um, uh, roles that we see in play. Um, the council is about to establish a uh, potential of a, a Brown School ad hoc. Uh, committee. Um, frankly, I, I don't know that uh, their recommendation and movement on that will happen in um, 
2022. And I'm just wondering if there's um, another use of those funds or a lesser amount of funds that we, you would um, uh, look for um, uh, and allocate those for a, for a different type of use. And, and again, I, I'm sure these are kind of the questions that will come up in, uh, in, in uh, confirmation hearings. Well, if you're asking me if Thank we you. have other, is that a question for me? I'm sorry. Yeah, it is a question for you. I'm, I'm, <laughs> my question really sorry. is, you know, you're asking for two hundred thousand dollars for money to be allocated to the Brown School for, um, you know, as as you went through, and I won't re reiterate what you you spoke about, but um, um, my point is, I don't know that the Brown School is, uh, I don't know that the City Council is going to make a decision on the Brown School in two thousand twenty-two. And I'm just asking if you think there's a, a different use for that two hundred thousand dollars, or uh, a, a, a request for a lesser amount to do other things like rental assistance or something like that. That's my ask. Okay. Uh, well, thanks for the question. Um, I, I mean, we don't know what's going to happen with Brown School, and we don't know when it's going to happen. Uh, the, the trust is trying to position itself so that it is able to respond when the development opportunity presents itself. We're hopeful about the Brown School, but we realize that it's a complicated process and uh, we are not making any assumptions, but like I said, we want to be ready. And um, we know that it's going to, like I've said, it's gonna be expensive. And we are also hopeful that there will be other development opportunities. Um, we've had some discussions uh, about some opportunities and needs. Um, and um, so again, we want to be ready when an opportunity presents itself. So it's a little bit like the open space committee where they don't always know exactly uh, what's gonna present them to, uh, to, to them uh, in terms of an opportunity. Uh, we want to um, do what we can to assemble funds so that we're in a good position. And often, you know, there might be a case where time is of the essence. Thank you. Uh, any other members of the public have questions? Please raise your hand. I see none. Uh, final uh, uh, opportunity for questions from the committee. Okay. Thank you, Madeline. Nice to see well, you again. Thank you. I appreciate it. Okay. Next uh, applicant is uh, the Old South Church Clock Paint Restoration. Hi, yeah, this is Jack Santos, and uh, thank you all for having me. Can you hear me okay, first of all? Yes, so, Jack, thank you. Excellent. Uh, yeah, thank you all for having me here at the, at the committee. And I'm here to uh, kind of make the case for a community treasure. There's probably no, nobody on this call that isn't familiar with the old self clock. Next sli slide, please. And specifically, we're asking for funding for the clock face. Uh, it's the hands, the numerals, the black uh, face behind them, the minute markers, they're rapidly deteriorating in need of paint. It was uh, put up there in 1896, replacing a 1785 clock on a church that was built in 1756. It's on the uh, Massachusetts, the church and the clock is listed on the Massachusetts State Register of Historic Places. It has been deemed uh, locally significant. Next slide, please. And me, I'm uh, the clock master at, uh, at Old South and hopefully with me tonight on the call is the Reverend Scott the Block from Old South, Old South Church and uh, Janine Cunningham who's an elder at the church and uh, Old South uh, is supportive of this project. Uh, I uh, manage and maintain the clock in the steeple. That's me working on it right there. And most of the expenses uh, in terms of keeping that uh, one over 100, 120, 130 year old clock running come out of pocket. And I'm more than happy to do it as a neighbor of Old South. Next slide, please. That's why. 
You can see the face taken by drone. Uh, these pictures of the of the clock face taken by drone. It's rapidly deteriorating. These pictures were taken in the fall uh, of last year. Uh, the the number, Roman numeral seven, in particular, on the left hand picture. Uh, on the right hand picture, Roman numeral seven, Roman numeral uh, eight. You can even see the deterioration on three, four, twelve. There's almost no paint on the minute hands. Um, and, uh, and, and the same with uh, uh, on, on the minute, uh, on the minute pointers and the same on the hands is uh, the paint has, uh, has, uh, has uh, deteriorated. So that's, that's in a nutshell, you can see it for yourself why that uh, needs to be uh, attended to. Next slide, please. These are more up to date as of yesterday. Uh, winter's been kind of tough on the clock. On the left-hand side, uh, the numbers are getting even worse, and you can clearly see the deterioration of the paint in the face in that lower picture. Um, the uh, and uh, the boards now, it's uh, you can see that the paint uh, is uh, are, you can see the seams in the boards because of uh, the loss of paint. On the right is the uh, East Parish Church in Salisbury, the Methodist Church next to the CVS. That was done about uh, two years ago now. The company that has given us the quote is uh, to uh, paint the old south clock is the same company that did that, uh, that clock face. And you can see how clear the letters are, uh, how distinct, and, uh, and that the clock, uh, the, the face of the clock, the black paint uh, is, uh, is, is in better shape as well. Uh, one side note. Both the Newberry clock, and the Newberry port clock, as many Newberry port clocks, um, uh, tower clocks, and the Salisbury clock were uh, were uh, generous uh, donations or assisted by John T. Brown in uh, 1895. He was uh, the Western Union manager here in town and uh, involved in just about every steeple clock. And I represent just a, a small group of clock masters that maintain all the clocks in the churches. Um, next slide, please. In terms of your decision making, we pretty much tick all the boxes uh, around the uh, evaluation criteria uh, that the city has has placed for historic preservation. The boxes we don't tick is that we're not open space and we're not housing, so that uh, that doesn't address those needs. And the clock is not a city owned asset, but everything else in terms of the character of the city, we are a city of steeples. I know uh, that Charleston, uh, South Carolina probably has claimed that first, but we're better than them. And uh, we, uh, and the clock has a, a, is a, is a great uh, benefit to our, our tourism and really uh, indicative of uh, the, uh, the city uh, as a whole. And there's a, a lot of community support for the clock. Next slide, please. We've uh, put out a call to the community. Uh, everybody's noticed that the clock is deteriorating. This is just a sample of the letters that we've received. There's certainly uh, a, uh, a lot of support by the community. Everybody notices the clock. By the way, I'll just make a pitch for myself. Uh, for most of this clock's life, the city paid for the maintenance and paid an annual uh, stipend to the clockmaster. I'm, I'm not here to ask for that. I'll be glad to do it out of the kindness of my heart, but, uh, but that is a fact that the clocks were so important to the city of Newburyport that uh, the city was uh, actually responsible for maintaining the clock, keeping them on time. Um, so that uh, in those days are, are long gone. But uh, the, uh, the, the, just to show you that the community is in support of this, I've already received a uh, commitment by community members uh, as well as organizations. So people are gonna put this, some skin in this game. Uh, even though I'm asking for funding from the CPC, the community is, uh, has expressed some interest in uh, promoting some funding as well out of pocket. So uh, I'm going to count on that from the community and have a, a fundraising campaign for, for their part of it. Next slide, please. And here's the budget. We're, look, we're asking for $4,650. $4,650. The community, I, I'm really confident that they can, uh, will be a contribution of $500 uh, raised from uh, community members and neighbors. The, uh, the budget includes any potential repairs and a contingency. Now, uh, I've been uh, 
asked specifically, and this is a you know kind of late breaking information, uh, whether we have noticed any rot or anything that we think will will impact this number at all. And we've been able to take a close inspection of the wood from the inside, as well as uh, through some uh, peepholes in the, in the clock. And it doesn't appear that there is any uh, any deterioration that is going to impact this number significantly. But we think we've got it covered. And we think the uh, committee is, uh, will, uh, will provide some, some funds as well uh, so that they do have skin in this game. And American Renaissance is uh, giving us a quote. They're the ones who did the clock in Salisbury. We're confident that they can uh, do this clock as well. The significant part of the cost is, is getting the lift up there and having uh, somebody work on, work on, uh, on, uh, on the lift. Uh, so I'll be happy to take any questions. Any questions from the committee? Jack, just not a question, one, one comment. Uh, uh, I, I think there's a typo in, in the, the budget uh, with your hand balancing at $50 an hour, which would be a bargain. I think he gets probably 150 an hour because the carry out number is 450. So. Oh yeah, well, three hours at 50. Yeah, I gotcha, yep. Yep. you're right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, oh, per we... face. That, that's why it's three hours per face. Three faces. Gotcha. Three faces. Okay. Yeah, I, I stand. I stand correct. There we go. Um, Joe Morgan, question. Yes. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, uh, Jack, I asked this question when you uh, presented in front of the Historical Commission. I was concerned that your your contingency might be a low in case you were to find some further deterioration once you got up close to the actual clock face. Um, and you still seem pretty, pretty certain that you can, you can, um, you can handle the scope with what you're, what you're showing here. Um, but just as a hypothetical, what would happen if you were to discover uh, some concealed rot conditions or say the, the substrates at the letters were no longer paintable or do you have, do you have a backup plan? Do you know what you would do? You mentioned that other, projects use metal numerals, uh, could you go that direction? Yeah, we could go in that direction. That is, that is actually what the uh, the, the, uh, the Tickham Street Congregational Church did, um, where when they did, redid the clock, they replaced the numbers with uh, aluminum. And I think they had those milled at the high school, if I remember correctly. So there was some uh, savings associated with that. Uh, when I started on this project, I looked at that alternative and I spoke to a lot of experts We've decided not to go that route where we're going to replace them with milled uh, aluminum or metal uh, numbers. Uh, we want to stay true to the historical nature of the church, you know, and the fact that we already have a preservation restriction on the church. So, you know, why, why, uh, why even kind of mess with that? So uh, I'm really confident based on your, your comments last time we went in there and said, yeah, let's take a real close look at this step. We're not gonna get any surprises. And if we do, uh, it's, it's worked into those potential repairs, carpentry, uh, as well as the contingency, but I just, I, I, it, it would be a surprise. If in our furthest imagination, it, it's, it was, it's not gonna be double, but I'm, I am also feel that the community, the community will come together and, uh, and make up for the, uh, the difference if, if uh, something like that does happen. Very good, thank you. Any other questions from the committee? Okay, uh, Scott DeBlock, you have your hand up. I did, uh, can you hear me? I can. Great, I just want to affirm the work of Jack and what he is putting forward to you uh, as uh, co-interim pastor at South Street Church. And we, it's just one starting point for uh, what we are about to work on, not only in our facilities, but in moving forward in ministry and mission in the town, in the town of Newburyport. And I want to thank Jack for all his work. Thank you, Scott. Any other questions? Okay, Jack. Thanks for your uh, presentation tonight. Uh, we can move on now. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Next item is the Cushing House Architectural Preservation from the Historical Society of Old Newbury. And 
Okay, who is here to present? This is Susan Edwards. Hello, Susan. And hello, and uh, good evening to everybody. And thank you for inviting us to uh, uh, present our uh, proposal tonight. Uh, we have been systematically working our way uh, around the property, um, both in uh, the house and uh, the uh, Perkins Mint building and the landscape. And it's time for us to focus on the exterior of the Cushing House and the architectural elements. Um, next slide, please. This is a three-phased project, as was our landscape uh, project, um, to address the, uh, the crown, the rope band, uh, the bead, the dental moldings, the gutters, the freeboard block, freezeboard trim blocks, and the soffit and fascia trims, as well as the, uh, the shutters. All of these um, elements are starting to uh, deteriorate and are uh, somewhat threatened. Next slide, please. Phase one is going to be a, a lot of assessment of the, um, the actual architectural elements. And uh, they will all be custom milled to match the originals. Our primary goal is to save as much of the original 1808 uh, element as we can. And at the same time, provide functionality for the building, for example, with the, the shutters and the gutters. Next slide, please. What we, what we have done, and, and actually this slide is a little bit hard to see, um, but I'm, I'm trying to, to show here the deterioration of uh, some of the elements. So let's just go to the next slide. These are, are elements that have literally fallen off the, uh, the moldings and into the gardens and along the sidewalk of the uh, Fruit Street uh, side of the house. And of course, it's always a concern for safety of visitors, but more importantly, um, we need to preserve these original architectural elements. Next slide. And here you can see uh, a corner of, uh, of the rotted elements, both the gutter and uh, the uh, bead molding and some of the uh, freeze black uh, trim. Next slide. This is on the, um, the north facade of the house, which is the, the uh, uh, facade that faces High Street. And if you look above the flag, again, you'll see deterioration. Next slide. And uh, this is the Fruit Street side of the house, uh, which is uh, perhaps most deteriorated. Uh, it, it takes a lot of weather up there on High Street. And uh, there's 214 years of wear and tear uh, on the property. Next slide. The, the shutters um, have really suffered from the, from the wind and the weather, both the fan light uh, over the front door as well as the uh, other shutters on the side. Over the last three years, we have done uh, repair work on these shutters. And at this point think that the best thing to do is to uh, replace the, the shutters on the north facade of the house, uh, matching the originals, and then to take the best from the th other three sides of the house and uh, restore those and replace them. Next slide, please. Actually, I think that may be it. Yep, this is the last slide. Thank, thanks, Caitlin. So, um, so our, as I said, our, our goals are to preserve as much of the original as we possibly can, to have functionality, and visitor safety. And one of the things that um, I think perhaps was not stated as clearly uh, in the application is that we are have sought uh, multiple bids on this 
and have been working with preservation uh, carpenters and uh, want to make sure that it is true to the original work. Um, additionally, as with our previous applications to the committee, um, we are leveraging the CPC funds with other gifts. And, uh, and if that is not possible, the museum will take money from its endowment income to match the CPC funds. So uh, we're, we're hoping that as in the past, this will be an opportunity to leverage funds from the community and from our supporters to help uh, preserve this National Historic Landmark. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Questions from the committee? Don Little? Yeah, it's just a more curiosity question. The um, application states in the project timeline, uh, the museum would be able to begin the project no later than early fall 2022. Phase one is expected to take six to eight weeks to complete. My question would be, uh, when is phase two and three planned tentatively? The reason that, that uh, I said fall was because I know the time that it takes with the city council votes and that it probably wouldn't be reasonable to assume that we could uh, start work until a contract was signed with the city in the fall. Uh, it would, the first phase would need uh, to be done in the, in the fall. Uh, and then our hope is that we would continue as with the landscape projects, uh, applying to the CPC um, for funds and to uh, not take any breaks that we would uh, look at this over a two to three year period. Very good, thanks. Thank you. Jane Healy. Hi, thanks. Um, you, you answered part of my question because I was curious about the bids because I only saw one in your application. Um, I didn't, I was wondering, could you tell us the date if it was there, I missed it of that bid and also what you're finding with your other bids. Have you received numbers yet? And the dates of those bids and yeah, I'm, I'm getting at the whole inflationary issue here. Absolutely. Um, the, um, the first uh, bids, the first bid that was included in the application was received in um, January. So very close to the application time, they had actually been working on it since the fall, but did the, gave us the final numbers in January. Um, there are two other companies who are also working on bids. So far, it looks like one of them is going to be um, the same range as the, the bid in the application. And we are still waiting on the bids from the third um, preservation team. Okay, thank you. And my uh, second question was about your preservation restriction. Um, I saw something that you have a 10 year one, is that correct? And But you are about to receive one in perpetuity? Exactly, we have a 10 year one, which runs out in 2027. And that's with Mass Historical Commission. And we um, agreed to have a perpetual preservation restriction with the um, historical committee, the Newburyport Historical Commission. Um, all of the work has um, for that preservation restriction with the attachments um, have uh, gone to Mass Historical Commission and we are only waiting, they have pre-approved it um, and we are now waiting for their final approval and then the signature process um, which hopefully won't take too long. Uh, we hope to have it within the next few months, two or three months. Uh, they're short staffed as many organizations are. And my understanding is that Michael Steinitz who is responsible for the preservation restriction program is still working remotely. Okay, thank you. Any other questions from the committee? Okay, uh, Don Walters. Yes, would you mind clarifying what you just mentioned with respect to a preservation restriction being held by the Newburyport? Was it the Newburyport Historical Commission? Yes. And I was under the impression perhaps, you know, some regulations have changed that if it's, if it's held by uh, the municipality, or in this case, the Newburyport the NHC, the, the term of the 
restriction is 25 years, it doesn't go into perpetuity. And I appreciate that's really a technicality. I'm just, just trying to be sure we get all the facts out, thanks. My, my understanding is that um, the, the current, as I said, the one we have currently with um, Mass Historical Commission is a 10 year restriction, but the one with the city of Newburyport would be perpetual. Okay, thanks. Uh, are there any uh, questions from members of the public? Okay, seeing none. Uh, thank you for the presentation and we'll move on to the next applicant. Thank you. Uh, Heritage Tree Preservation uh, Proprietors of Oak Hill Cemetery. Hi, sweetie. Uh, Glee Wordworth. Hi, can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay, great. How's everybody doing? Uh, okay. We lost you, Glee. We can't hear you any longer. You can't hear me? Well, stay up close to your microphone. Okay. All right. There we go. So, okay. So just follow them if you can't hear me again. Uh, so thank you very much. Um, so Oak Hill, uh, as you know, 1842, it was established. It is still an active burial ground. It's one of the first uh, landscape garden uh, cemeteries in the country. Uh, I've been working at Oak Hill since 2007. Uh, we've been very proactive in different projects. Uh, uh, the Granite Chapel, uh, Brown Chapel project, um, some restoration there, over 600 gravestones and 75 uh, curbings restored, planted uh, about 21 trees, we've planted gardens, um, cleared lots of brush, you couldn't see uh, several hundred gravestones when I first started working. And um, I'm currently also in the winter time, I work on a database, I have over 11,000 names of those who are buried in Oak Hill. And uh, I'm also taking photos of every single burial lot, of every single um, gravestone and inscription. Uh, the late Jeff Waugh, uh, part of the um, Northeast Shade Tree uh, uh, Company, he said back in 2008 and nine that Oak Hill has uh, one of the best um, uh, heritage trees uh, examples in Northern New England. And um, they, uh, Jeff, late Jeff Bob and his, his uh, company, they specialize in heritage trees, which are over a hundred years old. They've worked in uh, Atkinson Common also. And so we have some of the oldest trees in the report as well as Atkinson Common does too. Uh, we're a historic asset, uh, we're passive recreation. We have people coming through the cemetery dozens uh, every day and that traffic has increased with the Clipper City uh, Rail Trail right alongside. Uh, and CPC funds we received in 2008 and nine, $35,000. Uh, and if you remember a few years later, we had that huge windstorm. Uh, there was, uh, it was 90 miles an hour uh, winds recorded down at Plum Island. And uh, because of the CPC funds, uh, that saved uh, many of the heritage trees. They were safe during this storm. We did lose some smaller trees, some uh, pine trees, but the trees that uh, Jeff and his guys worked on were saved and we didn't have any damage in those, um, in those winds. Uh, financially, I just uh, want to talk about cemeteries in general in small towns and cities. They're not money-making businesses. Um, we, our endowment is now stable. Uh, it was, uh, it was, we were in serious trouble a few years ago, uh, but now it's okay. It's growing. Um, but that said, the income for Oak Hill and other cemeteries, we have very a lot sales and we have, uh, the funeral, uh, uh fees. Um, but that doesn't that doesn't um, pay for the two part-time workers, myself and the superintendent, Jim Smith. Um, and uh, we, we don't break even with that income. So we do need our endowment. 
uh, to help us out. The landscaping will cost between twenty-five to thirty thousand dollars a year. That's cutting all the grass, blowing leaves, uh, the cleanup of. Uh, uh, we have usually dead limbs coming down, and Jimmy and I can clean up uh, that uh, and do that work. We do not bring in uh, uh, tree companies to just do that work. We we can do that. Um, and in 2020, the, the 10,000 you funded for us, um, again, it was not the shade tree. Again, they specialize in the heritage trees. They have tree climbers. Uh, they don't bring in bucket uh, trucks. Uh, and and um, for other jobs, they might if they need to. Uh, but the bucket trucks could never, ever reach where they're able to climb up in these trees. And they're very, very bird and uh, animal friendly. Uh, they won't take down any um, nests or limbs that have any kind of nests in there. So back in 2020, um, if you go into Old Kill, the main entrance, there's 30 yards on the right, there was a dead tree. And Jimmy and I thought it would come down one day in a windstorm, but it never did. So the guy volunteered to take and lop off the top limbs. And I asked them to, okay, about 25 or 30 feet and leave the trunk with the holes in it because we're hoping that animals, so forth, uh, birds, uh, owls, um, wood ducks would nest. And um, sure enough, I don't know if you've heard, uh, we have a gray little screech owl who now is nesting in that tree. <clears throat> and when I ask people, uh, people have asked me about why did you leave that, leave that dead tree there? I said, for the purpose of the birds and the owls and so forth. Sure enough, we have a gray owl uh, nesting in the top hole, and we also have a red owl uh, nesting in another tree close to uh, the water tower. And Sue McGrath, uh, the Newbyport birder, uh, was just absolutely thrilled. And she said, this is a perfect example why uh, you try to leave some of those uh, dead trunks out for bird life. Um, Northeast Shade Tree will be donating. They have already donated uh, two days work and they'll be donating another couple days work because they just absolutely love Oak Hill. And uh, when they're in the area, they always drive through uh, to check on our trees. So that's, um, that's a summary. And do you have any questions? My favorite picture is your truck in there. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I was helping the guys clean up. Yeah. Any any questions from the committee? Okay. Uh, any questions from the public? Okay. Seeing none. Thank you for your presentation, Glee. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Bye now. Bye. Last but not least, I will uh, take off my chair of the CPC hat, put on my chair of the Open Space Committee hat, um, and uh, uh, basically say that uh, the uh, uh, once again, the application says it all um, and says it very similarly to years past, uh, but the uh, um, potential is still there to be hit with um, uh, opportunities, uh, some uh, likely to be in the significant uh, um, seven figure, eight figure range. And we got to uh, build our savings account to be able to uh, jump in with partners and take those um, opportunities when they present themselves. And that's all I'll say. Are, is there any question? Okay, thank you. Uh, any other business from the planning director? No, I have no further new business. Um, Sorry, I was muted confirm? there. No, nothing, Chair, thank you. Okay. Um, uh, any uh, a motion to approve the uh, minutes of February 23rd, 2022. Is there a second? 
Uh, I, I just had uh, one question on, um, let's see, it was a part C letter, letter from the Parks Department regarding Bartlett Tree specimen. Uh, in the uh, second paragraph, it says they would like to grant an additional 46 larger size C. Was that 46 or 426? Not sure I'm I sorry. And I'm sorry, I'm having trouble hearing you, Paul. This is oh. Rachel. So I can't, oh, I didn't hear what section you were referring to. Uh, section C, the letter from the Parks Department about the Bartlett Trees uh, Specimen Tree Grant. In the second paragraph, uh, at the end of the second paragraph, it says they would like to plant an additional 46 larger trees. Was it really 46 trees or was it four or two six? Boy, I don't remember. Uh, this is Don Little. I, I looked that up. It was 46. It's really? over a period of time, though. Yeah. Oh, oh, okay. Okay. I thought there was somehow there was 46 trees, 7,000. Okay. Never mind then. Chuck Griffin. You I just to clarify it. Yes, there's 46 more trees to be planted, and this excess of money would go toward that. It, right. It in no way covers the cost. <laughs> right. Right. Okay. I'll second uh, the motion. I don't think it's been seconded. Okay. Thank you, Mark. Okay. Uh, then uh, vote on uh, approval in minutes. I'll take a, a voice vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any, anybody say nay? Nobody said nay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Caitlin, confirm the next meeting date for me. Yep. The next meeting date and next round of presentations will be April 7th at 7 p.m. on Zoom. Okay. Do you have any idea whether or not we'll have that, uh, that uh, those bonding schedules? Um, before that time? I can send that around, yes. Um, I have that um, from um, Ethan Manning. I can send that around to everyone. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, any, anything else from any of you folks? Hearing none, then um, uh, this meeting is adjourned by unanimous uh, nodding of your heads. How's that? <laughs> Very okay. good. Go. Okay. Thank you. Good to see you all. Yeah. Take care. Thank you. Good Thank night. you. Good night. Thank Good you. Night, Good everybody. night.